Hello, and welcome to the Money Marketing Podcast. I'm Kimberly Dondo, Digital Content Manager. And in this week's Weekend Essay Podcast, we have features writer Amanda Newman Smith as she reflects on her family's music festival escapade, drawing parallels between role enforcement in the festival scene and the financial services industry, explored the dynamics of roles, responsibility, and outcomes in just a few minutes. Tune in for your insights that challenge the way we perceive the insights and their impact. Take it away, Amanda. Are the regulators' rules okay? My husband and I took our kids to their first music festival last week. It wasn't something we considered doing before, but circumstances led us to join the hordes of GCSE students at the Reading Festival. Our daughter Chloe is a big fan of American band The Killers, who headlined on the Saturday. At 10, she was too young to see them live in Edinburgh, which had been our original plan. We knew Reading would be more intense and feral than going somewhere like Wembley or the O2 especially as it has never been marketed as a child-friendly event. But we felt it was doable this year. Our youngest is now eight, the age at which many live music venues allow kids in, and he's become more interested and less fidgety at events. Going to a music festival with kids was always going to involve a bit of extra caution, a few more restrictions and compromises than going child-free. Dan and I decided the full-on camping experience wasn't suitable for our family, so we bought day tickets for Saturday and were careful to read all the rules, especially the small print. Bags were to be no bigger than A4 size. No drinks could be brought into the arena from outside. There was to be no readmittance for day visitors if you left, and all the usual rules that you'd expect were in place. We'd explain to the kids that for safety reasons, we would be avoiding the front of the main stages that were packed with over-enthusiastic teenagers, so we'd most likely be watching the bigger bands on big screens. But that didn't matter, as it was about being there and hearing the music live. Using the terminology of the consumer duty, the outcome was positive for us. There were some genuinely heartwarming moments, like one performer getting emotional at how so many people turned up to see him so early in the day blissfully unaware that as it was raining outside the marquee, a lot of people were just sheltering. Despite it being a very long day, we got to see eight or nine bands in total, the kids want to go again. But the experience has made me think whether the presence and enforcement of rules makes for positive outcomes, whether that's a festival or financial services. Does it have more to do with taking responsibility for yourself and your loved ones? A couple of days before going to Reading, I finished writing a series of free articles we'd called The Seven Ages of Advisors. It was an idea suggested to me by a money marketing columnist and FTRC founder Ian McKenna, based on Shakespeare's reference to the seven ages of man. Speaking to trainees in their late teens to advisors in the 60 plus age bracket about all sorts of industry related topics was fascinating. The younger the advisor, the more likely they were to see the duty in an uncritical light. Those in their 20s could see no real downsides, while those in their 40s felt it was not a silver bullet, despite agreeing with its broad aims. But advisors in the 60 plus age group who'd worked in financial services pre-regulation were the most sceptical, having lived with the unintended consequences of regulation. At best, they felt it was too early to say if the duty would result in better outcomes for clients. At worst, it was seen as another hoop to jump through, something else to divert advisors' attention away from clients and push up the cost of advice. I'm now wondering if we overestimate the effect that telling people what to do and how to do it has on producing positive outcomes. Most people do the right thing without needing to be told, because they're decent people. Those who aren't doing what's right couldn't care less or have their excuses ready if they get caught not doing what they should. At Reading, I witnessed a lot of inconsistencies in how the rules I'd swatted up on were applied and enforced. I'd expected my bag to be searched on the way in, probably because I'd seen so much media coverage about prohibited items. Ticketmaster had also been emailing for weeks with constant reminders about what to do and what not to do, that it bordered on harassment. So it was surprising to find on the day that security wasn't as tight as I'd expected. Don't get me wrong, it was enough. The tickets we'd downloaded to our phones were checked twice. An entry band was machine clamped around our wrists and we walked past a solitary dog handler with a sniffer dog. 
You could say that a couple in their 40s with three kids don't look like your average drug dealers, weapon-wielding maniacs or terrorists. But then again, what do these people typically look like? There were staffed barriers where I'd assumed my bag would be checked. A woman in the next lane had a backpack that was clearly bigger than A4, and I wondered if she'd be stopped. She wasn't. The queues to get in had become so long that staff told us they needed to get us in quickly. So we all just had to wave our wristbands at the staff as we quickly filed past, and that was it. We were in. Someone's Coke bottle was confiscated, so some checks were happening. But there was inconsistency around bottle caps on soft drinks once you got inside. Vendors with an alcohol license moved the caps from the bottles in line with the rules, but others didn't bother. There had been problems in previous years with bottles being thrown at the bands on stage. Given the state of the portable toilets near the campsite, we're not talking leftover Sprite either. So we'd expected the no cap rule to be strictly followed. Luckily, it didn't matter. I saw no fights, no bad behaviour, no dealing. One lad did ask my eldest if he had any pills, but that was an isolated incident. I have no idea what went on in the campsite areas, but in the arena, these things were not in your face. We found young festival goers pleasant and considerate of the fact that we had young kids with us. Some asked if we wanted to stand in front of them so our little ones could get a better view of the stage, and various teenage girls seemed to find our eight-year-old cute. These were just decent people, and the atmosphere was great because of that. The impression I get from experienced advisors who have been following the rules in financial services for decades is reverse. Regulatory intervention can cause complication and confusion for clients, regardless of the regulator's intention. Malcolm Cuthbert of St James's Place Partner Practice Rollo Wealth Management joined the financial services industry in 1994 and told me he has seen the length of standard letters and reports increase during that time, from three pages to 20, to comply with increased regulation. I do have clients that read every single word and question me on every single word, he told me. But one client said, Malcolm, just give it to me and I'll say you've gone through it with me. You can put together all sorts of letters, but will a client read and understand all this information? I'm not sure, he said. Sometimes those responsible for applying or enforcing rules don't quite understand them either. And that's where the inconsistencies come in. When I spoke to Highclere Financial Services partner and CI expert founder Alan Lakey, he told me about his first ever regulatory visit in the 1980s, which came from the Financial Intermediary Managers and Brokers Association, FIMBRA, a self-regulatory organisation. Lakey was ticked off while trying to phone a client during this visit, which baffled him as he was only trying to do his job. At the end of the visit, the FIMBA inspector said he'd identified three regulatory breaches. I was thinking, oh my God, what have I done? Lakey told me. The first breach was not having partner under his name on his business cards. Lakey rectified this by adding the word in pen and asked if doing this to all his cards meant he would meet the requirements. It doesn't look very pretty, was the inspector's huffy response. But does it meet your requirements? Lakey asked again. And the FIMBRA inspector reluctantly said yes, before moving on to the second breach. That was apparently not providing a female client with a receipt for a £10,000 investment. There's no receipt in that file. How do I know you've not stolen that money? Lakey was asked. He explained that there was no receipt from him because he'd passed the cheque on to an investment house. That had provided a contra note, essentially a type of receipt, which was in the file. Undeterred, the inspector moved on to the final breach. You're insolvent. What are you going to do about it? He said. Explain to me how I'm insolvent, Lakey replied. Lakey was told his income had been £40,000, but he'd spent 41000 making him insolvent. That would be the case if I was a limited liability company, but I'm a partnership, so there is no separation of my personal assets and my business assets. They are both included in the accounts, said Lakey. There, at the right-hand side of his accounts, was the value of personal assets, such as Lakey's house and car. The inspector left, and shortly afterwards, Lakey received a letter from Fimbra saying it had dropped the matter. The letter contained no apology or acknowledgement that an error had been made. Funny that. 
Hearing about people who are convinced they're right to criticise others without knowing all the facts reminds me of the flack festival goers got in the press on Monday for leaving rubbish in abandoned tents at Little John's Farm after the festival. Outrage readers left comments online about the hypocrisy of young people who supposedly care about the planet and trash it. I thought that was harsh considering there are not many bins around for a site of that size and you're limited by the rules in what you can take in with you. So if we expect people to carry their rubbish around all day, the A4 bag rule needs to change or just provide more bins. As for the tents, a lot of those we passed on Saturday morning looked like they collapsed by the evening. I'm amazed they serve their purpose until Monday. Nothing is built to last anymore. I discovered that when I tried to fit a new screen to my mobile phone and realised what a load of rubbish it is inside. At Reading, we carried our rubbish around with us in some carrier bags I'd kept inside my small handbag. But being bigger than A4 size, did those carrier bags technically breach the rules? My handbag was never checked, so who knows? I wonder what unintended consequences the duty will bring. I'm sure money marketing readers will have some thoughts. Thanks, Amanda, for another beautiful weekend essay podcast. We do hope that you enjoyed it. Please do keep up to date with all our new releases via Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you get your podcasts from. You can also keep up to date with all our new content published on the Money Marketing website, as well as our print edition, Money Marketing Magazine. So make sure to subscribe. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and TikTok. See you next time.